Hello. Hi, Nanny. How are you? Good. Are you liking school? Yeah. It's kind of boring. Boring? Hard. I didn't expect to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but do you have friends? Yeah. Oh, some of the same friends mm-hmm. from the other school? Some of the same friends, kind of. Yeah? Yeah, so it was like people that I knew from last year, but mm-hmm. like didn't really, like weren't that close with, now completely close with, you know? And then yep. the friends that I had, the actual friends that I had last year, are either at a different school or yep. we're just not that close. So it was kind of uh, like a change, but it's, it's kind of cool. Well, you'll get some new friends. I know you. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen, the reason I'm calling is um, I'm going to do my podcast on that movie, The Eighth Grade, with, that we talked about. So a couple of things. Yeah. Can you... Um, One is I was going to ask you if you could be my music director on this for choosing some music. And I was wondering if you would be the person who chooses like three possible songs, three possible music selections for my podcast. Yeah. There's a Google, um, a Google Play, a Google Google Music where I can use free music. And it's got all kinds of genres. They got rap and hip hop and pop and rock they got all kinds you can I'll, I'll send you the link and you can look through it and if you could pick out mm-hmm. like three possible songs for me to use like at the beginning or at the end or in the middle of the podcast that'd be great yeah definitely perfect okay. perfect thanks sweetie mm-hmm. okay I'll okay. call you uh, after a couple of days okay okay sounds good thank you bye Mm-hmm. You're listening to a small good thing. You're listening to a small good thing. listening to a small small good thing. Small good thing. Good thing. Small good thing. With Steve Zell. With Steve Zell. I'm Steve Zell. My wife and I took our grandkids to see the new Mission Impossible movie with Tom Cruise on its opening day last July. Ananda is 14 and she's just graduated from the 8th grade last June. Andrew, her brother, is with us too. He's 11. We're in the dark and we're hunkered down in our seats watching the previews. And one of the previews is for a movie called 8th Grade. That movie is playing in theaters right now as I speak. In the preview, we see it's about an 8th grade girl named Kayla dealing with the trials and tribulations of being an 8th grader in the modern world. It looks like the modern world since some of her difficulties in making friends, for example, seem to circle around the stupefying use of cell phones and social media. We see Kayla making her own YouTube videos on subjects like how to be yourself, or we see her in her bedroom in the dark sending out selfies with various filters on them on her Instagram account. We also see a scene where she has to make an appearance in her bug light green swimsuit at the end of the year pool party, which was a terrifying prospect even back in my eighth grade world. There are other situations she encounters that I can't remember right now, but what I do remember is having a queasy feeling in my stomach. After that preview was done, I leaned over to Nunny and I whispered, Nunny, does that seem pretty much right to you? And I'm thinking she's going to say no, or rather I'm hoping she's going to say no. And then she says, in not exactly a sad tone, yeah, most of it. And I feel my heart sink a little. Well, we watch Mission Impossible, we love that, and we're all walking back to the car. And I said, we should call it Mission Improbable, because it's it's not really possible for anyone to get into that much trouble all the time and survive. And We all laugh, and then I get this brilliant idea. Nunny, I say, what if I have a podcast where you and I go see that movie, Eighth Grade, and then you be on my show, and we'll talk about it? Yeah, she said, that'd be a good idea. I don't know if she was just saying that because she loves me and because she's an extremely agreeable girl, but as for myself, I'm thinking that would be a fun show because... I could put my granddaughter on, and that would be a different kind of podcast than any I'd ever heard. 
It wouldn't it be cool, I'm thinking, to actually hear what a real 8th grade girl has to say about a movie that's supposedly about the 8th grade. Well, anyways, like I say, that was last July. And I didn't think about it anymore until a couple of weeks ago when it was time for me to come up with another subject for an episode. And I remembered my idea of bringing Ananda on again. And I thought, yeah, that would be good. That's a good idea. You know, so just to see what's what about the movie, I did a quick search And I quickly discovered that even though my granddaughter had actually just graduated from the 8th grade, she couldn't see the movie 8th grade because it's rated R. And I'm getting that same feeling again that I had in the theater. Why is it rated R, I want to know. Well, it seems that there's too much of the F word being used by the 8th graders themselves, apparently. And then there's some sexual stuff going on. So I find out a little bit more specifically about the sexual stuff. And now I'm not sure if my great idea would be all that great. I don't want to take her to a movie where she's going to be embarrassed sitting with her grandpa. And I'm going to be embarrassed because she's embarrassed. What's more, I'm thinking that even if we were to make it through the movie, is she really going to want to talk to me about it on a podcast? I don't think so. I mean, there were a number of things going on during my junior high years that I was never going to tell my mom and dad about. Are you nuts? They would have been shocked. And if they found out, they might do things, you know, to protect me, like preventing me from hanging out with my friends, because some of those friends, as a matter of fact, talked about things I knew nothing of. And those were exactly the things that I wanted to know about. So anyways, I'm having second thoughts about my podcast idea. But I keep thinking about it. It bugs me. Because if this movie is an accurate depiction of the 8th grade, and I did see a mention from the director saying that everything that was in the movie could easily be gotten by reading the public Instagram post of 8th graders, then what that means is that every day, my 8th grade granddaughter, that girl I have loved from the day she was born, is being sent out into an R-rated environment. She's not old enough to see a movie by herself about the 8th grade, yet she's old enough to live in that R-rated world every day for 9 months, And apparently there's nothing I or any other adult that can do anything about it. And that bothers me. And I keep thinking about it. And then I get another brilliant idea. I say to myself, Steve, instead of getting all worked up, why don't you actually go see the movie so you know what you're talking about, right? Duh. Okay. So I'm going now to see the movie. And when I get back, I'll tell you what I think. Say, listen, while I've got a second here and I'm driving over to the theater, I thought I'd do a little commercial for the podcast. First, if you haven't already done so, you can subscribe for free to the podcast by hitting the subscribe button uh, on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or SoundCloud or Spreaker, whatever you're listening on. Some of them say follow. Most of them say subscribe. Some of you might be thinking that the word subscribe means that it costs you something or that I'm getting money or something like that. Uh, That's not so, not in the podcasting world anyways. If you subscribe, though, a couple things happen. One is you'll get automatic uh, notifications when a new episode appears, and that's a good thing. And two, by subscribing, it helps me in the podcast attract a little more attention in the big swim, and that's a good thing for me. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, I'd be much obliged. And then the other thing I thought I'd mention is if you're reading a book or you've seen a movie that you think might be fun to talk about, or if you've got any other good idea shoot me a short email would you it's a simple address to remember it's my name with no spaces steve zelt at gmail.com s-t-e-v-e-z as in zebra e-l-t at gmail or you can go to the website a small good thing.org and just right there on the front page is a little button that says message me boom you're one click away no forms to fill out or anything shoot me a little note so i appreciate that anyways Uh, I'm pulling up here to the theater in a little bit. I'll get back to you as soon as I uh, return.
Okay, I'm back. First thing, will I be taking my granddaughter to see the movie? Unfortunately, no. It's not so much because of the F word, which is so laid back into the background that it's hardly noticeable, at least to my ears, maybe not yours. I'm pretty sure she hears that word at least that much at her school anyway. So that's not the real deal breaker for me. But there are two or three sexual moments that are shown in such a way that I'd have to call the ball on that. So I think the R rating is justified on that count. I realize some people might feel differently about that, and I have nothing to say to them other than it might behoove them to see the movie first and then decide. It may be true that some 8th graders might have experienced some of these sexual situations, but it seems doubtful that most 8th graders will have experienced them. At least I hope it's doubtful, and there's that feeling again. But I've been thinking a little bit about that. The director could have made some very short cuts in the film, maybe just 15 seconds or so, in order to gain a PG-13 rating, as well as gain a larger audience and more cash, because PG-13 movies make far more money over the long haul than R-rated movies. But he intentionally decided not to do that, and what that suggests to me is that What he's saying is that he intends for this movie to be for adults, which brings me to the main thing I want to say, and it's this. I think you should see the movie, especially if you have a middle schooler or junior higher right now or are going to, or even if you've had one and now they're in high school. The young actress that plays Kayla is named Elsie Fisher. It's her first movie, and she basically knocks it out of the park. Look for her name next year at the Oscars if you're one of the 26 people who still actually watch that show anymore. I used to watch the Oscars, but I threw in the towel some years ago. It was always ridiculous. I get that, but it's it's warped into ludicrous speed now. Anyways, it's worth you seeing the movie just for her, and it's also worth seeing it because of the director, Bo Durham, who also wrote it. It's also his first movie. I never heard of him until one of my sons said to check him out on YouTube. He's 27, but he looks like he's 17, and he's smart, sometimes crude, and there's that R rating thing again, but smart, very smart, and literate. My first thought when I saw one of his stand-up bits was the young Steve Martin. Their styles aren't the same, but Martin is smart, and he's literate too. He used to do what Durham does, which is to get laughs by combining the very high with the very low, something very sophisticated and serious, quickly followed by something bawdy and lewd. Shakespeare used that same trick. Durham loves all the characters in his stories. He never plays any of them just for laughs. There's humor in this movie, but it's never cheap. It's the best kind of comedy. It's a serious comedy, and that's why 8th grade is more powerful and a better movie in more important ways than something like Mission Impossible. I'm not trying to bag on M.I. It's just that we're not thinking about Ethan Hunt after that movie is over, but we are thinking about Kayla, and we're thinking a lot. And what is it we're thinking about when we're thinking about Kayla? Well, we're really not thinking so much as feeling something, And what we feel through the whole movie and afterwards is anxiety. We worry for her. And I know now that was the feeling I felt when I watched the previews. From the very beginning of the movie, we're anxious for her because she's entering into an emotional arena and she's under-equipped. We're watching a 13-year-old girl do a high-wire act, but she doesn't know there's not a net. And that's why several times during the movie you could feel a palpable silence descend on the room. You know what I'm talking about. It's that that deep silence that happens when suddenly we realize something's really at stake, something emotionally and perhaps physically too. In movies like Mission Impossible, we're really not worried for Tom Cruise's character, whether he's going to survive. We know how the end is going to turn out, even though we don't know the details. And that's really why we're interested in that kind of story, for the details, for what happens next and then next and so on. The motorcycle chase through the streets of Paris, for example, which Cruz performed himself, I'm told by my friend Andrew Cochran, who I'm excited to say, by the way, will be on this show in a few weeks with his podcasting partner, Ryan Zaracani. What Cruz does is truly awesome, but we're not really worried about him or experience true anxiety for him because... We know he will prevail in the end. But we don't know whether Kayla will prevail. Because what she wants 
And that's another way to think about a movie or a story. Ask yourself what the hero wants and what's preventing her from getting it. And that will reveal the conflict. So then what is it that Kayla wants? There's a scene early in the movie that literally spells it out. The camera pans down a piece of notebook paper that she's divided into two columns. On the left side, she's written things I want. And on the right is how to get them. And what are the things she wants? More confidence. More friends. A best friend with the word best underlined. And as soon as I saw that list, my stomach tightened. Anxiety because I know what those things are and to not get those things to fail hurts, really hurts. So in this movie, we feel real emotion because something real is at stake. Kayla's aiming at some of the highest possible human goals. She wants what we all want and indeed must have in some sense or be literally in a world of hurt. These intense fundamental feelings and desires are why this movie resonates with adults because for a lot of us, we did not successfully graduate emotionally or relationally from junior high or high school. We received wounds there that still flare up decades later. We aren't confident, so we put on a false front hoping that we can fake it till we make it. We want to have friends, so we say things but have no idea what we're talking about. We throw the F word around because we think it makes us look strong. We don't know what we're doing when it comes to sex, but we think everyone else does. So women watch YouTube videos made by porn stars to get advice, like Kayla does. Or men scan through pornography because it's easier than having to relate to a real living woman that can resist him. We want to love and be loved. We want to have our gifts valued the humble presence we make to each other as a token of friendliness. And if those tokens are dismissed or held in contempt, well, that hurts. And that's why we're on tenterhooks for 90 minutes, because Kayla, sweet 13-year-old Kayla, is putting herself out there, as her dad well-meaningly urges her to do. And what Bo Durham seems to be saying in this movie is that, for the most part, she's alone in doing it. One of her goals is to make friends so she doesn't have any friends to be alongside her, someone that she can confide in and share notes with. I don't want to misrepresent the movie on this point. Kayla is not scorned or rejected by any of the other kids. She blends in. They are all friendly, or friendly enough towards her, but that's a different thing than actually having a group of buddies or girlfriends. Friendliness or friendly feeling is a good and necessary first step to becoming friends with somebody, obviously, but it's not the same thing, and it's certainly not the same thing as scrolling through your friends on Facebook every night. And again, to be accurate and fair in my reporting, Kayla at one point is briefly taken under the wing of a high school girl who has been paired up with her during high school orientation day, and this girl is genuinely friendly. In fact, she invites Kayla to hang out at the mall with her and some other high school kids, which Kayla jumps at because how cool is that to be an eighth grader hanging out with high school kids? But that doesn't actually end well because it leads her into some dangerous territory when one of the high school boys takes her home alone at night. It's a territory she thankfully manages to escape, and good for her. But for the bulk of the movie, she really has no friends, let alone a best friend. And there are no adults in her life either, except her dad, and I'll come to him in a minute. Teachers, for example, are just passing shadows in this movie who deliver a line and then they vanish again. And what's even more interesting to me as a contemporary movie is that there are no adult women in her life. Kayla's mother has left the family many years before, and she remains a no-show. The only woman who has the slightest interaction with Kayla is the mother of the stuck-up or cool girl, whichever way you want to see that. She's the one that invites Kayla to the the end-of-the-year pool party, and that's it for the adults, except Kayla's dad. And the good news is that he seems to be the real deal. He's home. He's present. He washes the dishes and makes dinners. He's in there slugging, doing his best to start conversations and break through Kayla's adolescent bulwarks. He drives Kayla to and from places. One time, God bless him, he attempts to keep a weather eye on her from a distance when she goes to the mall with the high school kids. But he's found out, and so poor dad, once again, his love sort of boomerangs on him. 
He offers the best dad words he can think of. I think you're the greatest, he says. I'm so happy that I have you. Just put yourself out there. And it's clear that at bottom, Kayla does love him and she will turn to him at an important moment in the movie. So that's a good thing. Yet even taking her dad into account, the movie still sends the message that Kayla, and by extension all 8th graders, must go through this dark passage alone. And there's truth in that. Let's admit it. The most crucial passages of life for all of us, at all ages, we must negotiate alone. They are the testing times where we can really fail and be wounded, in some cases maybe irreparably. Life, like 8th grade, isn't like Mission Impossible, where the outcome is completely predictable. But you know, maybe I'm too dark in all this. Maybe my review is off the mark. Maybe it's not even a movie review. Maybe I'm not talking about Kayla at all, but my own Ananda. And this is all personal. And Maybe what I'm feeling is that tension I spoke of three episodes ago. Do I wish to make my granddaughter safe, or do I wish to make her strong? And I confess my first instinct is to protect her, to make her safe. I don't want her to feel alone. I mentioned earlier that Bo Durham not only directed this movie, but he wrote it. And he wrote something into this movie that I would not have expected, but there it is. In about the middle of the movie, there is a scene where Kayla prays. She's lying on her bed. It's obvious she hasn't prayed a lot. Maybe this is the first time, but we recognize this prayer. If we're honest, all of us have probably prayed something similar at some point in our life. She proposes a bargain. Dear God, she says, if you will answer my prayer by giving me a really good day tomorrow, I will be happy to put up with a lot of bad days in the future. But please, God, could you just this once give me a good day? And guess what? The next day turns out to be a really good day. And then consider this. Near the end of the movie, and what happens at the end of a movie is always important. Kayla accepts a friend date with the nerdy boy, who was the only person at the disastrous pool party that swam over and talked to her. But now, maybe he's not so nerdy after all. Maybe he could turn into a real friend. And they're eating tater tots that he's made, or something like that, at his kitchen table at his house. And he's just sort of rambling on about something. She's quiet. And then suddenly, out of the blue, he says, Do you believe in God? And Caleb blinks and kind of hesitates for a second. And then she says, yes. Cool, he says. And then they move on. Why did Durham write those scenes? I don't know. I have no idea. But I'm grateful that he did. Because it lets me say that maybe Kayla hasn't been entirely alone after all. Left to get by on her own wits. Maybe there is a God and he's been with her all along and watching out. Maybe he's the kind of God that comes to the aid of anyone who calls for help, even if they've never prayed before or know how to pray or even if they aren't sure he exists at all. Maybe it's why one of the key lines in the Harry Potter series bucks us up every single time. Help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who ask for it. J.K. Rowling tells a very different story about adolescence. Yes, it's true. Harry must go it alone at the most critical moments. Yet he's not alone. She tells a story about friends and parents and adults who care and are near. And one of the splendors of J.K. Rowling's is that she understood what adolescents vitally need to hear. And perhaps everybody at every age needs to hear. You're not alone. Ask, and help will always be given. I think it might be a good thing if you see the movie 8th Grade, especially if you have an 8th grader, or you recently had one, or you're going to have one, for this reason. It's good to be reminded at a deep level just how hard it is for that young one you love. It will remind you to keep close, to not be afraid to push in once in a while, to cut them some slack occasionally to draw near to them and put your arm around them, even though they're likely to resist that. Try not to overreact. Don't be misled into thinking that nothing's going on in their aloofness because everything is going on. 
And speaking of Harry Potter and helping young people not to feel alone, I'm thrilled to announce that on the next episode, I'll be talking to Dr. Allison Baker about stories and why we need them and how young people especially receive strength by reading and hearing stories. We read, said C.S. Lewis, to know we're not alone. Yes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Yeah. All right. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. That was it. That actually was another perfect take. We'll do one more, one more three and that's it. All right. Sitting up straight, okay. facing the uh, phone like we're talking in the microphone. <laughs> take nine. Okay. The three songs you heard in the podcast are Glue by Michael Stigod, I Smoke Up by Drew Benga, and Toe Jam by Diamond Ortiz. You can find the links to all of them in the program notes, along with other links. I'm Ananda Zell, and I've been the musical director for this show. I hope you heard some small good thing. Thanks for listening. Perfect. That's it.